This is a production of Cornell University. All right, let's, let's skip a slide here, and let's go to this slide. Continental United States, distribution of moisture. Has anybody ever seen something like this before? OK, so the dry west, as you move east, it gets moist. My in-laws basically live someplace around here in Tulsa. And they live in the, uh, Tulsa's the, the northeastern, uh, yeah, northeastern sort of air region of Oklahoma. They call it green country. And it is green compared to the rest of Tulsa, uh, the rest of Oklahoma. But this is not green compared to Ithaca. But this is green compared to the Texas Panhandle. Okay? We're basically looking at that control of moisture going east and west as well as south to north. This is the green part of the country. Okay, what does that mean, though? We're talking about soils. What does that mean? Any thoughts? Well, where's going to be the less weathering, here or here? If moisture is controlling, if water controls the rate of weathering, we're going to have faster weathering rates here based on water. Now, there are other confounding issues when we start talking about temperature. If it's hot down here and cold up there, you know, the cold is going to slow their chemical reaction rate. But I have water here. Okay? So really what this is going to be controlling mostly is organisms. And certain parts of the year, it's going to be controlling factors of weathering as well. Does that make sense? Yeah? So let's think about soil formation. Where on this map do you think you're going to have, let's just, let's just go east to west. Forget about the north-south issue right now. Where on this map do you think you're going to have faster rates of soil accumulation? And where on this map do you think you're going to have faster rates of soil destruction? East? If this was your answer, you're probably right in both cases. I have more water here, so I'm going to have faster chemical reactions. But I also have more water here, which means I'm also going to have faster rates of erosion. Make sense? Controlling the soil formation. All right, so let's keep going. All right, so if we uh, take a transect across sort of the middle of America, and we basically look from sort of lake here all the way out, you know, to about here, okay? We're basically looking at a transect of different types of soils. Okay, if we go back to this map, we're basically looking from here to about here, okay? This graphic that you see, this is out of your book, but this graphic that you see up here is basically looking at what's in the soil and the depth of that. So here we're looking at a soil profile. Here's the top of the soil to a depth of 120, this is centimeters, I'm thinking. Yes, yeah, centimeters. Okay. And we're basically looking at basically a gradient of moisture. Okay. As we're over here, we're basically in permanently moist. And as we're over here, we're basically permanently dry at this component of the soil. Okay. Now, as we start over here in the Great Lakes, we have basically a tree coverage. And as those trees, as we move west, we move out of the trees and we move into the tall grass prairies, into the mixed short grass prairies, basically back into the deserts. Okay? So the biota is being controlled by the climate. Now let's look at what happens to the soils based on that biota. We start in the trees. Okay? Every, every fall, what happens? We have leaf fall. Organic matter is added at the surface. And if we look at this section of organic matter, where is all the organic matter? Basically on the surface. But as we move out into the plains, fire regimes change. Okay? For, trees can't survive. Now, that's changing as we, get, as we basically control fire. The tree range is moving farther and farther west. Okay, but if we look at the natural system, the trees can't move this way because of the fire regime. So what happens is we get taken over by grasses. 
And in the wetter part of these Great Plains, they're tall grass prairies. Now what happens with grasses? Grasses don't shed like leaves off of trees. Grasses shed, yeah, they die at the top, but they also shed their roots. Okay? And so as a result, you can see this bulge or this dip, perhaps a better word, this dip in organic matter. Because organic matter is not being delivered strictly at the surface anymore. It's now being distributed farther down. And as we move farther west, we move out of the tall grass into the short grass and the mixed grasses. And you can see that as the plants get smaller, they're shedding. They're not going as deep. They're shedding less organic matter. And that dip comes back up until ultimately we get way out here, not quite in the deserts, but into sort of the edges of the deserts. deserts. We still have organic matter accumulation, but it's right up at the surface, back basically where we had it in trees. Okay? That's the depth. It's not the amount. It's the depth. Okay. The other thing that we're seeing is here we have this permanently moist zone, here we have this permanently dry zone, and then we have this zone right in here where we're seeing accumulation of calcium carbonate. Just use this as a, a sort of a salt indicator. Okay. As the system gets drier, salts get closer to the surface. Well, why? We had this conversation about that tunnel in between next to Mann Library, right? It's not that there's not salts here. It says, as we move this way, the delivery of water is not sufficient to move the salts through the system and out of the system. In this situation, what's happening is that water is hitting the ground, and it's going into the groundwater, but it's not making it all the way down, or it's going into the ground. It's not making it all the way down to the groundwater and being lost to the system. What's happening is it's going down, and it's being stored. And then through evapotranspiration, the water comes back up. Okay, when the water moves into this system, it starts solubilizing the salts. And if it starts solubilizing the salts, it makes the water salty or saltier. Okay, those salts now move with the water. Does that make sense? And if the water starts moving back up to the surface because of evapotranspiration, with evaporation, the salts are going to be left behind. They don't evaporate, and as a result, the salts accumulate farther and farther and farther to the surface until you get, literally get to the deserts where you will have salt pans. The salt comes literally to the surface and it coats the surface. Does this make sense? Yes? OK. All right. Yes, sir. Wow. I'm moving up in the world here. OK, but that's basically this transect. And this transect is controlling. Is controlled the, this is the moisture transect. This moisture is controlling vegetation distribution as well as the salt distribution. So you can see how the climate basically controls these distributions of three different soil types. Here's a temperature one. Okay, we've sort of, we, this is pretty obvious, but these are basically isopleth temperature lines. 77 degrees down here, 37 degrees up there. What's that going to do to the chemical reaction rates? One would certainly affect, expect that down here in the Keys, chemical reaction rates are going to be a lot faster than up here in Toronto. Right? Now, just because we talk about this, or this, these isoplets, and these are these averages, the mean Earth temperature, okay, but that's the mean over the entire year. These temperatures change on a seasonal basis, but they also change at a diurnal basis. And they change also based on depth. Okay, here is a graph of ground temperature versus the time of year. Okay, each one of these lines represents a different depth. So this line right down here is at the surface. Okay, this line right down here is 12 feet down. You can see that the patterns are very similar, but the peaks and valley of them are a lot more extreme. Right? Makes sense? Well, maybe not make sense, but you, can you see that? OK. Well, what's going on? Well, the Earth is acting as an insulator. The closer and closer you get to the surface, to the air, the more and more extreme the temperature events during the year occurs. So wintertime, cold. Summertime, hot. Moving back down into wintertime. Okay? But the closer you get to the air, 
where the temperature extremes are more extreme, okay, the more extreme the temperature change in the soil is. Okay? So imagine this C10 roll. If this is my soil profile, that's the surface of my soil, and this is the bottom of my soil, it's colder or hotter here depending upon what time of year you are. In the summertime, it's hotter, which means chemical reaction rates are going to be a lot faster. In wintertime, it's colder. This has basically been inverted, right? Down here, chemical reactions are going to be a lot faster. Does that make sense? So as a result, we're going to see a lot more extreme events at the surface rather than at depth. A lot more of the stuff that goes on in soils is happening at the surfaces. Cool? Make sense? Now that is a seasonal. Let's take a look at a diurnal. Okay? This is the profile through the soil. So that's the top of the soil down to a depth of 10 meters. Okay? And this, this line basically represents the temperature constant. Okay, what is the average temperature during the winter time? And what is the average temperature during the summertime? And you can see someplace down here, basically the winter time and the summertime is the same temperature. They're, they're, they're basically the same. But you can see that at the top, not reflecting, very much reflecting this, that during the summer the temperature is hotter, during the winter the temperature is colder. But you also can see at the very top that day night, the diurnal effect. Daytime is hotter in the day. Temperature is hotter in the day, whether you're in the summertime or the wintertime. So we also have a diurnal effect here as well. So it's not just seasonal, it's not just annual, it's diurnal. Okay? So imagine what that's going to be doing to processes in the soil. Okay, let's move on. Okay, here is a plot basically showing, this is out of your book as well, but this is mean annual temperature versus mean annual precipitation. And this is the distribution of different types of, of, of ecotypes. Okay, so this graph right here is the desert. That one across the top is the tropical forest. Here's the Arctic and tundra. And you can see how the arrangement is. You can see how they react to each other. If I have not a lot of precipitation, I'm down here at the desert dry end. On the other hand, if I have a higher temperature and a higher precipitation, I basically make these tropical forests. Okay? When the temperature comes down just enough and the precipitation is still fairly high, I get these deciduous and coniferous forests. The minute the precipitation comes down enough, I move into the grasslands. Make sense? Okay. These arrangements, climate arrangements, are basically controlling the distribution of the plants. And the plants, in turn, Right, go right back to that soil forming factor equation. Do you feel comfortable with this? Am I beating a dead horse at this point? No, you guys are still sort of good with this. Okay. We can look at the continent. This is basically the same graph, except in a different type of image. You can see the same There's precipitation increasing this way and increasing this way, temperature increasing this way. You know, you can sort of modify and place it like this, and here it is. There's the distribution of these environmental types. And as a result, you're going to see different types of soils. This is not that much different than this map that we started with, way back at the beginning, right there. Did that look that much different? Not really. This is an overlay of parent material and climate and biota. This is just climate. OK? Cool? All right, let's move on. Let's start, let's start talking about organisms, since that's what we've been talking about for a while. Okay, uh, most obvious organisms are basically the accumulation of organic matter is basically is perhaps the most obvious first step of soil genesis. The first thing that you really see. Okay, when you start, you know, I've dropped a pile of material here. What's the first thing I'm going to start seeing? That's the first change that I start seeing. It's that organic matter accumulation. Okay? And basically what we're looking at is we're looking at humus, bad term, but basically looking at organic matter. Okay? It's being decomposed. That decomposition produces organic acids as well as byproducts of the hum organic material. These organic acids can react to soil minerals and basically produce weathered products. Okay? The first thing we really see is basically the accumulation of that organic matter, the darker colors. Okay? 
That material then is decomposed. It produces these acids, which in turn start reacting with the minerals, and we start seeing soil genesis. Okay? Now, the other kind of, and perhaps generally this is a little bit more mature environment, but the other thing that's really obvious when we start talking about biota is bioturbation. The organisms are moving things. The one that I like the best talking about is worms, because I think worms are these amazing creatures, both destructive and, cre and, and, and creative. Okay? But imagine one earthworm in the soil. Okay? I put leaves on top of the soil. What is that earthworm going to do? It's going to start burrowing in that, and he's going to grab that leaf, and he's going to pull it down. Okay? He's going to eat it down in its nest, or whatever it's called, its burrow. Okay? It's going to decompose that material. It's going to throw out casts, earthworm casts. Okay? And just by the movement of that worm through the system, it has dramatically altered that system. Well, first, it's taken organic matter that's been up here, and it's moved it down here. Okay? So it's, there's transportation. It's relocated stuff. Not only has it moved it down here, it's also eaten it. So it's transformed it. All right? It's also made this huge hole in the soil. And what's that going to do to moisture and, and, and atmosphere? It's now a preferential flow path, right? Water is going to pour down this, which it wasn't before, and air can also get down this. So I've now modified the, the climate around that tunnel, which means other organisms can potentially take advantage of that. Earthworm tunnels, the coatings of earthworm tunnels. The er earthworms have this like mucilaginous material, and they basically coat the size of, earth of their tunnels. The population of microbes on that tunnel dramatically increases compared to the soils around it. I start moving different types of organisms into it, be, you know, into this tube because of one other organism. I'm going to affect all the other processes that are going on in that material. Okay, and added onto that, the earthworms brings food down for everybody. Cool. Okay. Here's an example of uh, biological interaction on two different soils, and you can see basically two different profiles. Okay, over here we see this big, clear, white zone here. Actually, you guys remember what this horizon is called? An E horizon, okay? Versus this, where we have a really rich, t dark surface. In fact, the richness comes down fairly deep, okay? So, what do you think is going on here? The one on the left is younger? It could be, but I would make the suggestion that the one on the left has a different type of organism than the one on the right. This one is dominated by grasses. This one's dominated by trees. Where's the organic matter being added here? Throughout to down here, top and throughout. Where's the organic matter being added here? Right at the top. Okay. How about this one? Now, in this case, this is the exact same soil. This is one organism that's doing that. This one does not have the organism. This one does. The lowly earthworm. Turns out the uh, northern sort of hardwood forests, we have a, the native, native forests for the northeast are a mixed nut hardwood. Lots of big nuts and smaller nuts and small a mix of trees. Well, earthworms are not native to the northeast. Basically, with the glaciation, all worms were extirpated north of the glaciation line. So all the worms we find up here, they're all exotic. Okay? The forests developed prior to the worms' arrival. So what's going to happen when earthworms start moving through the system? No earthworms here, earthworms here. What's the big difference? They start chewing up all the debris All this stuff up here is basically being chewed away. Okay. Now, it's just a small example. If you are a large nut tree and you, I mean, you depend on your nuts germinating to create the next generation, right? Okay, and if these are large nuts and they de get deposited in here, it's pretty hard to find them. On the other hand, if they get deposited here 
it's suddenly a lot easier to find them. What do you think those creatures that most of us, some people call deer, and I call rat with hooves, what do you think they do? They eat them. They love them. Okay? They can't find them. They, eat, they love them here too, but they can't find them as much. You can find them here. And what's happening is the population of the forests are changing. Because, and they're the, the, the trees that are taking over are small seed trees because the nuts are basically getting preferentially harvested by the deer, as well as the squirrels and everybody else. I'm not just going to blame the deer. Okay. Another big change is if this stuff gets decomposed, what do you think is going to happen to the nutrients that are stored in this? It's going to become a lot more available fast. Faster available? What is that? How do you say that? The nutrients are going to become available a lot faster. Okay. Forests tend to be what we call they're, be called, they're called tight ecosystems. They're tight. The nutrients are very tight. Okay? You have worms come into the system, and the system becomes very leaky. Okay? I.e., the nutrients are moving through the system so fast because the trees are adapted to a slow release of nutrients. The nutrients are being released so fast that the trees can't capture all the nutrients. Where do those nutrients go? Downstream. So as a result, these forests are actually losing the nutrients because of the introduction of the worm. Interesting? Okay. What do you think that's happening to the soil? If the nutrients are leaving the system, the organic matter is not accumulating at the surface, you have a very different soil. If I don't have this organic matter up here, I'm losing water storage. I'm also losing insulation for temperature changes. This stuff basically acts as a blanket. Okay. So I have less water in the system or more extreme water events, and I have cooler soils. Cooler soils mean I'm going to have slower reactions, which means I'm going to have slower genesis. Let's keep going. There are some other extremes here. Anybody know what this is? Termite mound. Termite mound. Okay. These organisms are basically taking subsoil and mixing it up to the top, taking stuff above, organic matter moving it down. They're modifying the environment. Huge effect on soil genesis. How about these guys? Everybody seen something like this? Anybody walked in the woods and see something like this? It's a wind throw. Basically, a tree has been upended by the wind. The wind knocks it over, and the roots basically take all of the soil with it and basically spin it. Okay? That's going to modify how these soils are formed. In two weeks, you're going to move into an environment up at the top of Mount Pleasant. We have two soil pits. One soil pit's in an agronomic area. It's been plowed. Another soil pit has been in a forested area. It's been timbered, but it has never been plowed. Take a look at the topography of the one site versus the other site. Imagine I have a landscape of pit and mounds like this. Here's a pit, and a mound's going to form when this decomposes. What's that going to do to the microclimate of that environment? Every one of those pits is going to be the wet spot. Every one of those edges is going to be the dry spot. If I have a wet spot versus a dry spot, I'm going to have m different effects in soil genesis. I'm also going to have different, I mean, I've got a low spot versus a high spot. I'm also going to have slight changes in temperature. The low spots, because of cool air drainage, the high spots going to be a little bit warmer. Okay? The low spots are going to have more organic matter. They're wetter, they're cooler. The high spots are going to have less organic matter. Yes, they're better drained, but they also are better drained. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, questions. We'll move on for the rest. Of, we'll finish at this point. Good? We good to go? All right. Remember? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.